So welcome everybody. Um, here online today, we have Ansi Romalo, from, uh, who's the chair of the King Committee, representing South Africa's King Reports. We have Tamitsi from, Tamitsi from Botswana Stock Exchange. He's the head of listing and trading, and he's going to talk to us about the governance codes in Botswana. We have Chaka, who is so welcome, the, everybody. Um, the previous CEO of the IOD in, in Lesotho. And Chaka was very involved in Lesotho's Implomi Code, which was, um, it's in publication at the moment. It was launched late last year. We have Kangai here, who's the chairman of the Institute of Directors of Zimbabwe, going to talk to us about the Zim Code. And we have Tian, who's the CEO of the Namibian Stock Exchange. And he's going to be talking to us today about the NAM Code. But perhaps today we need to kick off with ANSI since it's International Women's Day. So Ansi, if you can tell us a little bit about um, the King reports and the King codes and specifically um, the, the national imperatives that have been built into that. So thank you, Ansi, over to you. Uh, thank you, Carolyn. Uh, good to be here and happy Women's Day, everyone, um, women and men. <laughs> um, I'll start off um, perhaps by um, explaining uh, where the name of our corporate governance reports come from. Uh, I often get asked, who's king, what's king, you know, what is the king committee? So, so let me start there and explain. So the king committee is named after Professor Mervyn King, who convened the first um, who convened the King Committee in the first place in 1992, I think it was, um, Mervyn. And um, what we did in South Africa was to follow the model that, that was um, um, implemented in, in, in the UK. Um, in the UK, Sir Adrian Catbury convened the Catbury Committee and the Catbury Committee was responsible for the what was known then as the Cadbury report, subsequently became the combined report, and now it's simply called the UK Code um, uh, on, on Corporate Governance. Here in South Africa, we, we um, decided to stick with the, the brand, the King brand, and so we retained the name, the King Committee. The remarkable thing about the King Committee is that it's a private committee. As I mentioned to you, uh, Prof. Mervyn King um, convened the King Committee under the auspices of the Institute of Directors here in South Africa. And really what it boiled down to was to uh, approach um, a couple of stakeholders who would have an interest in the, in, in the drafting of the report to form part of that committee. Um, and since its inception until today, that's the nature of it. The King Committee does not have formal government backing, um, funding in any way. Um, the King Committee is not a regulatory um, a, a body. It is simply a private committee and it relies on the Institute of Directors for its um, infrastructure, its um, media reports, if anything, its, its um, it's, it's um, secretarial services, um, it's social media uh, presence, all of that is um, channeled through the, the IOD. And it's quite remarkable that a committee uh, who really has such humble beginnings and, 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 and really uh, so, so ordinary in the sense that it's um, um, an, an informal gathering of, of um, um, stakeholders uh, governed by a terms of reference and, and nothing more. And yet um, we have the support of our stock exchange, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, which made um, the um, disclosure on the application of um, um, the King Code a listings requirement. Um, and on top of making the disclosure of listings requirement, the JSE also requires that specific aspects uh, which, which are specified 
um, uh, um, should be followed by um, by listed companies. In this instance, as far as those specific aspects are concerned, um, our listed companies don't have an option. They simply have to comply with, with, with King 4. Now, um, in all other respects, it's the disclosure of, um, of the application um, uh, principle that has to happen. We call it apply and explain, as 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 we call it. The the other um, huge um, source of credibility of the King reports is that the South African courts have started using uh, the King report as the standard against which to benchmark directors' conduct. Uh, because the King reports are widely um, accepted by our directors as the standard, um, our courts um, are saying that this is the, the um, what could be expected from the reasonable director, and hence it gets um, um, uh, it is adopted for for um, our court judgments. So. Um, uh, I've mentioned two specific examples as, um, um, from which um, the, the King reports derive its, its credibility, but I suppose there are also these informal um, recognition that, that the King reports have internationally for being so uh, progressive around corporate governance. And that brings me to um, the influences over the years um, on um, the King reports. It must be remembered that the first King report was issued at a time when South Africa was transitioning to a democracy. And at that time, um, it was thought that with the history of apartheid, um, with the hi history of South Africa coming out of um, economic um, and cultural isolation, um, that we must become attractive for um, foreign investors, um, that we must be able to evidence that we are on a di different path, an ethical path. So from the beginning, from the first King report, one can already see the difference if, if you compare, for example, the the King report issued in 94 and the Catbury report can already see that um, the King report has is imbued with this um, um, ethical underpinning, this, this idea that business is, is about more than, than profit. Um, it's as far as I know, um, for that time, the only report that even um, um, referred to ethics that even refer to other stakeholders such as, as employees. Um, and, and this philosophy um, has only grown um, as we went on this journey to King Two, King Three, and, and then King Four. King Two was very well known for its triple bottom line approach to say, well, that there's not only a financial bottom line um, that companies should strive for, but also um, the, um, uh, the environmental bottom line and then the societal bottom line. And in King 3, um, where we arrived at was to say, but actually these three aspects are not three separate bottom lines. They are intertwined and interdependent and connected. And therefore we started um, referring in King 3 to um, integrated reporting. Um, and integrated thinking, and that um, uh, reporting uh, strategy should, should follow this thinking to understand that the, the company, the fate of the company and the fate of, the, of its stakeholders and the natural environment are really all connected. And, and I, I, I believe that that has been proved in the recent developments around climate change, around COVID to, to be very sound um, to be based in, in, in reality. Um, um, so, so King 3's big thing was around integrated um, um, thinking and reporting. And then King 4 
um, I think its big feature, its, its highlight is the fact that um, it is outcomes based. Uh, we're saying in King 4 that it's not only about implementing the practices and ticking those boxes, but it's actually understanding um, the quality of governance. In other words, once those boxes have been ticked, what are the governance outcomes um, that um, as an organization you have achieved? So can you say that you have an ethical culture in place? Can you say that you're performing well, not only financially, but um, across all aspects? So yes, economically, are you performing well, but, but also what, how are you performing in terms of your impact on the environment? How are you performing in terms of your impact on society? Um, so, uh, so, so good performance across all of these aspects is the second outcome that we say companies um, and all organizations should strive for. The third outcome that we refer to is effective um, control. In other words, is there discipline in the company? Is there process? Um, is um, the board able through the system to govern um, effectively? Is that system in place? Are those controls in place? And then lastly, the fourth outcome that we say um, organizations should strive for is legitimacy. In other words, are you trusted um, by your stakeholders as an organization? Do you have credibility? So these four outcomes are is what I'm calling the litmus test. Um, if, if you're unsure as to how to answer um, whether your organization um, has all four in place or some of these in place, um, you have to go back to your governance system and, 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 and structure and, and ascertain whether they are these are all four in place. If you, if you, if you know that they, or if, if you have a suspicion that they're not, well, then that's when you go back to the input and say, well, do we have even the right boxes in place? Because that's, of course, your starting point. So it's not wrong to tick the boxes, but the ticking must lead to certain outcomes. It's, it's not right to stop at ticking the boxes. It's, it's what we say in, in, in King 4. Just the, the other thing, um, uh, perhaps um, 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 dimension of, of, of King 4 that I, that I must mention because it's in many respects a departure from what we see in many other jurisdictions is the fact that we follow a stakeholder inclusivity approach. Now, this wasn't a deviation from King 2. In fact, uh, 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 sorry, from King 3. In King 3, we already said that we follow a stakeholder inclusivity approach. Uh, I think in King 4, it just received much more um, emphasis. Now, the implication of that is um, that that old adage that we were taught um, in our law schools, um, business schools, that um, economics, uh, economic students are taught this thing about um, director's duty is to act in the best interest of the company. And the best interest of the company um, is represented by the best interest of the body of shareholders. Where we come from in, in King 4 is that that is thinking that's not fit for the times that we live in anymore. Again, I'm, I'm referring to climate change. I'm referring to COVID as two examples of uh, why I'm, I'm saying um, that. So we require our directors to exercise their duties in the best interest of the company. And then it must be uh, kept in mind that the company is nothing other really than a nexus of stakeholder interests. And in um, being attentive and attuned to that nexus of stakeholder interest, um, um, directors need to take into account when they act in the best interest of the company, um, uh, uh, these needs, interests and expectations from, from key um, stakeholders and how those affect the company. So, so that is um, um, 
it's just a highlight on content of, of, of King 4. I, I told you already about the outcomes-based approach. Um, the other feature that I think I need to highlight is that King 4, um, we drafted it to apply to all organizations, uh, which also makes it fairly unique among corporate governance codes. Um, there are a couple of others I know who also um, speak to um, all organizations, but mostly I, th I think um, you will find if, if you look at other corporate governance codes that, that they are um, targeting um, public companies. For us, we're saying um, corporate governance is an ecosystem. And um, in South Africa, especially recently with state capture, we have seen how the environment um, gets influenced if, if our state-owned entities, for example, um, don't follow good governance, it affects um, how our private entities um, operate. If in the private sector, um, good governance is not followed, then similarly, it affects um, state-owned entities, it affects nonprofits, um, SMEs, um, and, and so forth. So we believe it's an ecosystem, so, so our code applies across. Now you'll ask me, so how did we manage to make one code speak to such a, a, a broad audience? Um, well, firstly, our language, we, we, we're not speaking about boards and directors, which is company language, and not all organizations are companies. We're talking about governing bodies and organizations, just as an example. Um, what we did is we wrote the main code, or, we, or the code, um, there is only one code. We wrote the code at a very high level, um, uh, so that it is generally applicable. Our principles specifically are, are, are pitched at, at that aspirational level that, that is true of all organizations. And we're saying that where you adapt for the, the type of um, organization that you are is at the level of the practices that support those principles. So an SME will... Um, apply the practices that deal with delegation to management quite differently from how a um, listed company would, would apply those practices. And um, that is, that is um, exactly how it should be because governance should be fit for purpose and fit for the size, complexity and nature of, of the, the operations. Um, as long as this mindful application, application and judgment has been applied. And maybe the last feature that I of, of King Four that I, uh, which I want to conclude on, um, Carolyn, is around how we define corporate governance. Now, you, you know, the traditional definition of corporate governance is, is that one that we used in the first King report, um, which came from the Capri report, which said corporate governance is the system by which, uh, um, by which companies are directed and controlled. Gradually, um, in the journey from the first King report to King 4, um, we landed in King 4 on the definition that says corporate governance is the exercise of ethical and effective leadership. And I think that encapsulates it so well, because if you think about corporate governance, what you need is competence, in other words, effectiveness, and you need um, that, that competence to um, be supported by um, ethical uh, behavior and an ethical stance. And if you have both of those, the competence um, and the ethics, then I think that bodes well for, for, for corporate governance. So I'll conclude there. Thanks, Carolyn. Thanks, you. Thank you, Ansi. That's a great summary. I really appreciate it. Now I want to move to Tion because that I know that the Namibian um, the Namibian Stock Exchange's NAM code had some basis on the King reports. 
and uh, there was actually some joint work done with the King Committee. Maybe, uh, Tion, if you can give us a little bit more insight into the NAM code and the background around that and what it's intending to do. Thanks, Tion. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, the, the, the NAM code came out of, out of the history of Namibia being um, closely tied to South Africa. At independence, we took over the entire legislative base of South Africa as our own to start with. However, since then, we've had some divergence in legislation. So when South Africa revised their Companies Act, they introduced the concept of business rescue, and that was also contained in King 3. Um, that led to a situation where Namibian organizations and specifically listed companies ran into a situation where there, there was a case of which parts of King 3 could be applied and which couldn't. So we reached out to the Institute of uh, Directors of Southern Africa and uh, co-wrote the NAM code together with Ansi and her team. She was still the director there at the time or the CEO. And uh, that, that led to the, the NAM code then specifically excluding the sections of King 3 that could not be applied in Namibia under our legislative framework, but also then including some, some sections uh, that, that elaborated where our companies act didn't necessarily contain it, such as the fiduciary liabilities that uh, the directors should carry in their actions because our companies act wasn't all that clear on it while the South African Companies Act had expanded on that. So following that drafting process, it was launched very successfully. It also became a, a listing requirement for listed companies directors. And uh, subsequently, government has actually taken a lot of it on board, written a lot of it into their state-owned enterprises regulations, well, however, not, not yet amending our Companies Act. That's in process as well, whereby we believe a lot of this will be written into the Companies Act itself as well. So as this has evolved over time, then King 4, of course, came out, which is, as Ansi said, very high level and, again, easier to apply without legislative interference. So what we did was we allow our listed companies the choice. They either follow King 4 or NAM code. Reason for that being, as Ansi said, the ticking of boxes is, is not necessary, doesn't necessarily lead to the outcome. But if you're coming from a fairly low corporate governance base, we find that the boxes are certainly useful before you get to the point where you can apply it on an outcomes base. So what we've had companies applying NAM code for various years and then moving over to King 4, going directly to the outcomes. The, the, the biggest difference is probably that NAM code, as with King 3, is an apply or explain basis. So if you're not going to apply it, you explain why you're not applying it, while King 4 is apply and explain. So you've got much higher level principles that you're explaining how you are applying them and looking at the outcomes that you're achieving. While with, with King 3 and with NAM code, you've got a bit of a different approach. And I think it leads well to companies reaching that point. We can certainly see it in the integrated reports from our listed companies where they are in that journey. And as Prof King is, is on the call today as well, um, he currently heads up the um, African Inter Integrated Reporting Council, where we're actually trying to achieve that, I serve on that council with him. When we're trying to get to the point where we can harmonize the requirements to the point where we all are reporting the same things and in the same way. And that speaks very much to the international code as well, where I think we're all trying to get to a point, especially with listed companies and, and uh, creating a a level investment field for investors to invest into companies and for companies to report so that everybody knows they're all reporting on the same things and trying to achieve the same goals. And especially in the last couple of years, I think we're, we're seeing more harmonization towards that, maybe because of sustainability becoming such a big issue. Um, I can mention under NAM code at the time, the, the Social and Ethics Committee was not yet a requirement. We've issued a directive subsequently to that that now requires all companies to have a Social Ethics and Sustainability Committee. So where we're seeing movements along that line, you're seeing the ESG investment sphere growing rapidly throughout the world. You're seeing a new investor class coming to market that really cares about this, that, that 
to some extent, maybe cares more about this than the direct immediate returns because the long-term gains of a sustainable company is more than the next year's dividend gains. And then that shows you what Ansi was talking about in terms of where we came from to where we are now is actually a fundamental difference in, in, in what people are looking at from companies, from where we were a generation ago. So it's an interesting field and I'm seeing a lot of development in this. And even in a small economy like Namibia, we've issued a green bond, we've issued a sustainability bond, and there's, there's, there's oversubscription in the market for these, for these products because you've got a social awareness that I don't think there was even there 20, 30 years ago. So uh, it's an evolving field and we definitely have to keep pushing the boundaries on this because the, the market is demanding it. Thank you, Tian. And if I can move to Tameti now, um, it's also on the regulator side. So Tian obviously representing the regulator side. So we also have representation now from the Botswana Stock Exchange. Um, so Tameti, from your perspective, is your uh, do you have a code of governance or what are your kind of listing requirements um, with you, you know with in this regard? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Carolyn. Uh, just do a mic check there. Can you hear me? Yes, all good. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So I'll just make a short presentation um, from the perspective of Botswana Stock Exchange. Um, uh, let me just see if I will be able to move it. Okay. So uh, essentially, uh, as far as the Botswana Stock Exchange listings requirements are concerned, um, the Kintri Code of Corporate Governance is a listing requirement. Um, but uh, the, you, you, the companies have an option to comply with Kint4. Um, and in fact, uh, as at December 2021, we had like 52% of our listed entities uh, working towards or complying with Kim 4 So uh, the, the adoption has been pretty good since uh, the King Code of Corporate Governance was made a listing requirement, which was in January 2019. Um, also, we have another institution which uh, is called the Botswana Accountancy Oversight Authority. And this is the overall corporate governance authority in Botswana for public interest entities. Uh, so the BOA was established through the Financial Reporting Act uh, of 2010, and its principal objective is to provide oversight to accounting, auditing services, and to promote standards and credibility of financial uh, and non-financial aspects in Botswana. So of course, when this was established really uh, uh, targeting public interest entities, and these are state-owned enterprises. Uh, these are companies regulated by the non-bank financial regulatory authority. Uh, these are companies and banks, which are um, uh, regulated, of course, by the Bank of Botswana, and also large private uh, companies in terms of uh, level of employment, as well as turnover. So uh, all these companies, uh, we, we refer to them as uh, PIEs and they are regulated uh, by BAOA uh, with the intention to enhance international confidence in the financial uh, reporting, the audit uh, process, uh, as well as the corporate governance uh, in Botswana. As you would be uh, aware, we try as much as possible to, uh, to, to attract foreign investors and uh, how else to, to attract foreign investors, but through good corporate governance and good financial reporting. However, in recent uh, months, in fact, this the process of drafting a Botswana specific code of corporate governance has, uh, has, has, has started. Uh, and this is being spearheaded by BAOA. And indeed, it really has much to do with the, the fact that uh, you know, introducing corporate governance uh, has to do a lot with changing the minds and hearts, uh, uh, be, you know, because for a long time, even in, the, in terms of the listings requirements, at least until 2019, these were not compulsory. Um, 
Uh, and so there is still a lot of people that don't understand the value addition from that. Uh, and also the fact that, uh, you know, the investment landscape is changing. As Tian mentioned, uh, we now have different types of investors who are looking at impact investing, green investments and so forth. So we need to have a code that speaks to, uh, to these realities in our country. And uh, the historical um, uh, statutes as well, if, 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 for example, I give an example with uh, the Bank of Botswana, for example, it has uh, been established under a specific uh, statute, which uh, often clashes with King 3 in terms of what uh, the, the, the governance situation should be. So uh, the idea is that the, the, the Botswana Code of Corporate Governance is going to uh, look at these issues and smoothen them up. So um, we also have in Botswana here, the Botswana Institute of Chartered Accountants, of course, uh, which is the professional body of accountants who are domiciled here. And its role is to, of course, represent the members' interests to develop the profession, protect the public interest, and ensure uh, observation of the uh, highest professional and ethical standards, of course. So what uh, the, the Bika role at the moment is, uh, is actually the chairperson and the secretariat for the integrated uh, uh, reporting committee of Botswana. Uh, so, uh, the the we the Botswana Stock Exchange actually sits in that particular committee, and um, whilst since we are um, through our listings requirements, um, we are looking to uh, push uh, listed companies to uh, compulsorily adopt integrated reporting. Uh, it's not something which is uh, compulsory. It's not it's not mandated yet. It's on an apply or explain basis. Uh, but there's definitely an intention uh, to include this requirement in the new uh, code uh, for all public interest entities. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, until 2019, uh, the, the BSC requirements were quite flexible in terms of uh, codes. Uh, you could choose to comply with UK if you were a company which has roots in, in the UK or the South African KIM3 or KIM4. Uh, but um, uh, after 2019, it actually became a listing requirement um, uh, to, 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 to make sure that all the issues comply with KIN3. Uh, and of course, um, some of these attitudes that I mentioned uh, still exist uh, among the issuers. Uh, there is still that a bit of resistance. But, you know, I think it, it comes from, in, in most cases, a lack of understanding of the fact that um, you know, if you are complying with the latest uh, corporate governance codes, uh, it's more like, you know, dressing yourself up nicely so that investors can be interested in your share, in, in your stock. So I think it will take just some bit of education, uh, not only from us, but also uh, from our partners at BICA and BOA and the Botswana, the, the inter integrated reporting uh, committee is doing uh, quite a good job of that. Um, and also the BOA has also started focusing a lot more on corporate governance, I think, since 2019. And they declared, when they declared the KIN3 to be the national code for Botswana. So um, uh, as I said, what we do is uh, we, 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 we apply the KIN3 as a listing requirement. However, issuers have an option to explain it as, as, as you're aware to explain away certain uh, certain aspects however there are those that you cannot explain away you have to apply which have been um, uh, brought into the listings requirements directly like for example procedures for appointments to the board of directors you gotta have that uh, policy you gotta have a balance of power and authority gender balance uh, in your board you gotta have an, a lead independent director where applicable um, uh, you got to have, uh, you know, certain committees are mandatory, like the audit committee and the remuneration committee. And we do censure listed entities which fail to um, tick the box, as you may say, as far as the, uh, the, the KIN3 requirements or principles. Uh, however, with BAOA, they apply the code directly and they actually find uh, pies for failing to apply the code. And uh, what they do, uh, 
we work really closely together in the sense that they do refer the results of their inspections uh, to the BSC for further action if, if, if necessary on an annual basis. So in terms of um, investors here in Botswana, um, the institutional investors, uh, particularly the pension fund managers, fund managers uh, they worry about executive pay. They worry about succession planning. They worry about le levels of disclosure. And indeed, um, they have made recommendations to the VSC uh, as well as to the BAA, uh, which I think those are some of the reasons why we are also looking at reviewing the code. Um, for example, they, they would like to see a binding vote uh, when it comes to remuneration for ex executives. Um, they, they also complain, of course, about the fact that some of the listed entities have such a high remuneration quantum uh, to justify, I mean, when, when you look at the returns that go to the shareholders versus what the executives are paid, they are not happy with that. Um, they believe that there is insufficient disclosure of executive executive pay schemes. Uh, they would like to see an implementation report uh, being uh, uh, published with the integrated report. They believe that there is insufficient long-term charges. So for example, uh, for the most part, uh, they believe that the fact that most of these listed companies do not have a formal requirement uh, for shareholding in the long term for executives uh, harms um, investors. So, and of course, there's the issue of the executive being an executive chairperson. So anyway, um, without uh, taking too long, I've, I've just put, it, uh, I've put up uh, some of the, uh, the, the organizations that I've been speaking about. Uh, you'll find some links to their website so that you can get uh, more information uh, uh, on, on, on what's going on at the, uh, in Botswana. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline. Thank you so much for that. Um, very detailed information and it was really useful. Thank you very much for that. I'd like to um, move on to Kangai then in um, Zimbabwe to give us an approach that's been taken in Zimbabwe and perhaps you can give us, so you, as chairman of, of the uh, Institute of Directors, perhaps you can give us an understanding of, of the approach uh, that's perhaps different in Zimbabwe uh, from the, the stock exchanges that we've heard from before. Thank you. Um, thank you, thank you so much. I, I hope you can hear me. Uh, kindly can. confirm. Yes, we can. We just can't see you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, my internet is just slow. So sure. I think if if I can do audio, that would be much better. Fantastic. Okay. So yeah, um, the Zimbabwe corporate governance right now. Um, is, is on the back of the National Code on Corporate Governance, uh, which is the Zim Code. The, the background to that is that um, around about 2003 to 2004, there was a crisis in the banking sector where some institutions failed because of insider lending and more focus on non-banking activities. So we also had challenges in owner-managed businesses and in some cases, there was negative effects of centralized power, a small group of people or the major shareholders wanting to run the business their own way. And in such a way, there was really abuse of the rights of the minority shareholders. And in some cases, their business that were giving their directors and their executives loans, uh, even though they were not banks, they would give a remuneration packages to executives and to board members. That was really unethical. So as a result, you know, across all multiple sectors, it became very apparent that there was a need to have a structured systems and approaches that could bring into being ethical leadership and good corporate governance. And to borrow from a court um, that was picked uh, from Arthur Levitt, the former chairman of the United States Security Exchange Commission, uh, it said that if a country does not have a reputation for strong corporate governance practices, capital will flow elsewhere. And if investors are not confident with the level of disclosure and the legal system, 
capital will flow elsewhere. And if a country opts to lax accounting and reporting standards, capital will also flow elsewhere. So it became apparent that there was a need to actually come up with um, a good framework for corporate governance that everyone would, would fall on board. So both the government and the private sector moved in to embrace, to embrace some, some approaches that would bring about uh, corporate governance in institutions, both the private and public entities. The government first established the framework of governance uh, for state-owned enterprises and parastatals. And it also moved on to establish what they call the corporate governance unit under the office of the president and cabinet. That is administering a new act now, the Public Entities and Corporate Governance Act. And the government also moved on to review the Kanban Act um, to incorporate corporate governance in it. But as inclusive stakeholders uh, came on board, there was a development of the National Code on Corporate Governance, which become the main code or the principal code that is being used for corporate governance in Zimbabwe. It borrows from a number of institutions and uh, thought leaders like the King Three, King Four, um, the UK Director's Handbook, but this became more of the Zimbabwe's Director Handbook. So the goal of the code was to provide a reference point for corporate governance issues in Zimbabwe. And it applies to all entities, whether these are public sector or private sector or non-profit making organizations. And it does complement and supplement other codes in the sectors, but it is the main reference point that is used uh, for corporate governance. How it, it came into being is that um, a Zimcode trust was created by three anchor promoters, the Institute of Directors, where I'm coming from, which is a non-profit organization and is Zimbabwe's home of good governance and ethical leadership. And it's membership driven, inclusivity, diversity with youth and women being involved. And we had another partner called the Quality Corporate Governance Center or ZIMLEF. These are corporate governance consultant that came on board to help us with secretariat roles of developing the, the ZIM code. And then we also had the Standard Association of Zimbabwe, which is the governing board for standards uh, within Zimbabwe. So in order for that to take place, we actually had sponsors and service providers that came on board. Um, the largest bank in Zimbabwe was a platinum sponsor. And then there were so many other companies from multiple sectors coming in there, a different level of sponsorship that was available. And then we had people opting to provide services. you know. And after that, we had a board that was set up to run the project. Government was also involved. If you look at the Zim code for Zimbabwe, there is the Zimbabwe anti-corruption, there is the public entities, institutions coming on board, there's the audit general, there's a number of regulators in Zimbabwe that were involved in setting up this uh, Zim code. So how it was developed is that the main board uh, was chaired by one of the renowned uh, lawyers and under him, he was assisted by a steering committee. And under these steering committees, there was thematic committees that were looking at, you know, specific areas that needed to be brought onto the court. And a number of institutions came in consulting, volunteering individuals, and that made it possible for us to have uh, the Zim code. The main key influences with interest in corporate governance right now in Zimbabwe, it's, it's us as the Institute of Directors, it's the corporate governance unit uh, within the government itself, it's the Lawyer Society of Zimbabwe, it's the Zimbabwe Leadership Forum, which was part of the work we did. Um, there are a number of other players like the Institute of um, I think Kangai's network has finally given in. He was battling in. I think if we give Kangai a little bit of time and perhaps at this point, uh, if we can just, in your mind, if you can just put that to the side and I'll call on Chaka. Chaka, if you can maybe just give us some insight into the Lesotho code because the Mishlobi code 
had a lot of involvement from various stakeholders as well as that we're hearing from Kangai now. If you can give us a little bit of background, I know you've got some slides that you'd like to present as well, but that would be very interesting. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Caroline. Um, Oh, good. good, we can see that. Yes, thank okay. you. Just an overview of uh, the slide deck that I will be talking to. Uh, with respect to Lesotho's perspective on uh, corporate governance, um, from introduction right through uh, to further information. Um, corporate governance, our journey has been uh, necessitated greatly. As a result, uh, there was a dire need uh, for development of the governance code in Lesotho. Uh, which emanates from a lot of things that we see, even in South Africa, where there's an advanced code, uh, as we can, as we've just seen the Zondo Commission. So Lesotho has not been uh, um, an exception in terms of corporate scandals and all these other um, governance uh, 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 issues or challenges. Now this necessitated uh, a deep introspection and reconnaissance with respect to where have we gone wrong? Um, traditionally, Lesotho or Basotho are known as the mountain peace loving people, very progressive uh, in terms of our cultural uh, heritage, which dates back to when our King Moshe founded the nation in the 1800s. Now, what became apparent is that uh, there has been a lot of moral degeneration arising from uh, the impact of globalization and uh, industrialization, and of course, uh, uh, migration as it were. So we moved away from who we are as a people, who we are as a nation, which now led to these uh, corporate scandals and all uh, uh, governance uh, mayhems or dysfunctions that we, 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 we saw over the years. Now, the Institute of Directors Lesotho, where I served as a chief executive officer, in the past year, had been established in 2004 following uh, a workshop that was done by Prof. Mervyn King, uh, where he was invited to come and give a talk across the board, uh, corporate Lesotho and the entire socioeconomic landscape then. And at the time, Following that uh, exciting presentation and or exposure to good governance uh, led by uh, Prof. Mevin King, uh, Institute of Directors Lesotho was established. But unfortunately, uh, since 2004 to late 2017, 2018, it had been sitting idle as a shelf company or shelf entity, as it were. So this necessitated these introspection and reconnaissance that I alluded to earlier. Now, um, the Lesotho Governance Code is named after Chief Moshomi. Chief Moshomi is known 
for his legacy of good uh, ethical leadership, uh, leadership that is underpinned by uh, empathy for his people. And we know that Chief Mushomi was the counsel and advisor of our King uh, Mushweshwe, who nurtured him into the phenomenal king that he became, that was able to build this formidable Basutu nation and this country, Lesotho, in the 1800s. So this is in a nutshell um, um, what inspired the name uh, Mushomi and, and why the uh, Mushomi code. And now the, profit, the process of development of uh, governance code followed an inclusive approach uh, through establishment of a task force uh, that was later renamed uh, Mushomi Committee, of course, taking uh, learnings from uh, the King Committee in South Africa. Now this inclusive approach uh, covered all strategic sectors of Lesotho's socioeconomic landscape, regulators, professional bodies, uh, government of Lesotho, uh, state-owned entities, um, non-state actors, uh, the banks, corporate Lesotho broadly, and uh, the consumer. Uh, representatives who are part and parcel of the Mashomi Committee. Uh, it's a representative committee that represents uh, an array of strategic sectors uh, socio in the socioeconomic landscape of our country. Um, the code development, as I said, uh, it was based on timeless perennial wisdom of chief prophet rainmaker Hila Mushomi, as he is known. And they say, keep the best for last, because when you, when you do things uh, at the, uh, following pioneers that have come before you, you are able to learn from their mistakes, you are able to learn from their challenges, you are able to learn. Uh, and also tap into um, a lot of learning from them. So in our case, we, we, we took learnings from uh, the South African King Four, uh, the UK code and the Nigerian code. And this propelled us and offered us uh, to be agile and responsive uh, in line with current best practices, international practices, as we saw also uh, the recently launched um, ISO 37000 standards, which we have also tried to align with. The philosophy of the code, <clears throat> um, as you can see the, the symbol, which symbolizes a diamond, and we know a diamond is a very, strong and uh, uh, luxurious and a gem. So our code is really, we believe as a gem based on the philosophy of Chief Mushomi. Uh, and the philosophy really as it reads is that a responsible leader pursues peaceful and productive alliances, accommodates stakeholders, and uses new instruments of power to create intergenerational value. So this philosophy dates back to the 18th, 17th to the 1800s uh, in Lesotho or in this region. So this tells you that even way back before uh, the advent of industrialization, Moshomi and his peers were ahead of themselves in terms of embracing and understanding good corporate governance, although they were perceived as, as primitive 
uh, as they had been uh, behind industrialization. Now you see the logo of uh, the code. It has borrowed from our, our, our artifact, the Basutu hat. And we know this Basutu hat is named or takes uh, its inspiration from a mountain in the Tababusiu area where the Basutu fortress of Tababusiu lies. The mountain is called Kilwani. But the rest of the detail on the uh, logo embraces an earring that Chief Mushomi, when Mushoshwe had completed his training and ready to, to ascend to the throne, he gave him this earring, which symbolized listening, that you are a king through your people. So it's imperative to listen to your people. Um, the philosophy really talks to transformational leadership inspired by uh, Moshomi's uh, philosophy. Now, it, through transformational leadership, uh, we achieve three key outputs, outcomes, which is peace, productivity, and the intergenerational value. And out of that, we are able to uh, compile and reflect an integrated report that uh, enhances accountability in all its forms. Um, our approach really is the apply and explain approach. And this relates to, we have two or three categories. The first one uh, category, which is one that you, uh, that's before you, before you on the slide, the apply and explain. And this relates to large corporates, state-owned entities, and really large organizations. And this large is determined by a threshold of turnover, of course, given the size of our economy in Lesotho. Um, Companies with a, with, with a turnover of 10 million and above, those are the ones that would apply and explain. And then the SMEs and NGOs would apply and or explain. And now the structure of our code is categorized really into six clusters, um, board leadership, board conduct, board composition and structure, sustainability, audit compliance and risk, and of course, dig digitalization governance, which is a slight deviation from what King and other codes, when they talk about IT governance, we are really uh, embraced a much broader comprehensive approach, which is digitalization, which also entails internet of things and many other uh, aspects such as innovation uh, and really be able to embody uh, the advent of the fourth industrial revolution as it were. Um, the outcomes which I highlighted or alluded to in the previous uh, slides that talked to the philosophy. Now we have three key outcomes, which is peace, productivity, intergen intergenerational value. And these three outcomes, as you can see that uh, white line that swerves going across the three of them, it signifies that they are interrelated and intertwined. None of the three can exist without the others. And also this is aligned to Lesotho's national motto, which is peace, which means uh, and productivity, uh, 
represented by rain. And lastly, prosperity, which is reflected by intergenerational value. And here, we, 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 we are trying to, or we have elevated learnings from other regions that I alluded to earlier on, that we are the one currently uh, code that articulates peace as, it, it, as its key outcome in this form. Of course, King Four talks about ethical culture, but we're saying we elevate peace uh, uh, because you can never have an ethical culture without peace. You cannot have uh, uh, a stable economic environment without peace. You cannot have uh, a good, positive organizational or institutional culture without peace. So peace, as it were for us, is paramount and of critical importance. Hence, we have moved to elevate peace. And of course, looking at the current uh, challenges in, our, in Europe now, in Russia and you, in the issue, in the, in the, in the, in the case in point, uh, Russia uh, invasion on U Ukraine, there's lack of peace. And as a result, has great impact to the rest of us uh, uh, globally. There is talk of high fuel prices and talk of high food uh, prices due to a lot of these commodities that we import from, from Russia. Uh, so with the advent of sanctions that are rising, it tells you there is commotion, there is no peace. As a result, it, it hampers productivity. And of course, it hampers intergenerational value. I mean, for the people of Ukraine, as those uh, uh, bombings and things that have occurred there as a result of that invasion, a lot of buildings and structures and infrastructure has been damaged. So you cannot have intergenerational value uh, in those circumstances. I'm just emphasizing this point. And of course, to achieve inter intergenerational value, we're saying, Institutions should foster intergenerational thinking or intergenerational mindset, which will ensure that we, 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 we transition from ESG, which is environmental, social, and governance, uh, as we have now done, to elevate it to EESG, which now puts in the economic aspect to enhance and bolster ESG. These are some of the, 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 the learnings that I alluded to that has given us an opportunity to enhance our offering in our governance code. Uh, I have tried to summarize um, our key differ differentiators. What, what sets, what literally sets uh, Moshomi Corporate Governance Code apart from the rest. And of course, as I said, um, we have founded the code on the philosophy of King Moshomi which entails a rich tapestry of Basotho cultural heritage and uh, developed transformational leadership approach to uh, governance. And our code is versatile and comprehensive applicability. A very interesting one here. Uh, we are including political parties and churches I mean, we saw in South Africa and the neighboring uh, and, and, and the region uh, that the advent of churches now have become uh, 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 institutions that are seen to generate wealth under the guise of 
religion and theology. And of course, there's uh, a need to govern those because they play a vital role in society uh, through spirituality and other uh, 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 nurturing aspects that they provide to our people and nations. Political party is a key one because we say uh, governance or institutions and nations or countries, they rise and fall in leadership. So we know political parties uh, are the ones that are the hub of national leadership. These parties transition into governments and governments that take care of the entire uh, governance framework for a country. So if we are able to, 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 to enhance robust frameworks for political parties, that then means we are able to positively influence uh, embracing of good governance in government and the country at large. Uh, the code further encompasses both apply and explain. I've already uh, alluded to this in the previous slides. And also this one, we've moved from IT governance to digitalization governance. And we are the first code to introduce key innovative outcomes, that of peace interlinked with intergenerational value. And I've already talked to this uh, in the prior slides. Um, we have transformed ESG by introducing economic aspect to achieve EESG, -E 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 which is also incorporated in our integ integrated reporting section of the code under sustainability and integrated reporting. I've already uh, alluded to this earlier. And lastly, the code introduces economic linkages and local supply chain programs to achieve sustainability. It's, it's, it's quite funny, before the webinar started, we are having a little chit chat amongst ourselves as panelists, and we're actually saying there's going to be a boom in the uh, market, there's a, there's a prospective or potential boom in the market for, 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 for um, rare, uh, 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 um, rare earth commodities as a result of uh, the, the Ukraine, uh, the Russia-Ukraine saga. So of course, now this talks to the mining sector. Now, if there's that boom, and uh, our governance framework has this economic linkages and local supply chain programs. It says there's a big boom for the country that is hosting that foreign investment in the mining sector for the benefit of the country and its people at large, and therefore achieving that inter intergenerational value that we talked about. So I was just highlighting that example uh, to, to, to hammer and uh, emphasize uh, uh, this key differentiator in our code. And uh, just to give you a quick recap on progress to date, uh, code development process, as I highlighted, started from 2018 to 2019. And of course, the Institute of Directors, through the support of the government of Lesotho, was uh, a beneficiary of a, a funding from the African Development Bank that saw us uh, develop this code. And of course, as I indicated earlier, the Institute of Directors Lesotho is fairly at its infancy stages, but we have been able to punch way above our weight when you see uh, comparatively, um, Institute of Directors South Africa, when they developed uh, their code in the early 90s, they were already 
an, a, a, an advanced and robust uh, organization, astute. And they are currently, what, 62 years old because they were established in 1960. So if you look at us, we got resuscitation in 2017, 2018, but we have fairly uh, catched up in developing a governance code for Lesotho. And we had a stakeholder validation workshop in June, 2019, and ultimately launched the code on the 2nd September, 2021. And of course, I thought it's imperative to highlight uh, this in red, to underscore this grave challenge that IOD Lesotho finds itself in of uh, insufficient resources, particularly uh, revenue generation, and or capital to be able to deliver on its mandate. And as a result, uh, this was further exacerbated by the advent of COVID-19, which saw a lot of uh, companies in, in Lesotho experiencing the ramifications of COVID. And of course, the cost of doing business going high with uh, uh, compliance with uh, COVID-19 regulations. So it terribly affected us as, a, as, a, as an infancy institution that is still uh, growing and uh, impacted us very badly. And of course, one of the challenges here, which I didn't of course highlight is that corporate Lesotho or the socioeconomic uh, entities have been pretty much playing a wait, a wait and see game because they felt the IOD at the time did not have a compelling uh, member value proposition in the absence of a governance code. So instead opted to subscribe with Institute of Directors uh, South Africa. Of course, we, we, we are completely landlocked by South Africa and a lot of uh, uh, our trade as our only major trading partner, we, 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 we understood. But however, in the advent of the development and launch of the code, we are hopeful that many corporates and many NGOs, the government entities, and a lot of other partners will join hands. Uh, it was quite very motivating and uh, uh, exciting to hear our brothers from Zimbabwe telling us that they got full support from, from, from their, 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 their stakeholders in, in Zimbabwe across the socioeconomic landscape of Zimbabwe. So we wish the same for ourselves. And of course, I wish to acknowledge the support that we currently enjoyed on the launch by three corporates in Lesotho, uh, Standard Lesotho Bank, uh, Lesotho National Development Corporation, and uh, of course, lastly, uh, the Soto Insurance Group, Hollard, uh, were quite uh, thankful indeed. And of course, these uh, challenges of resources have to some extent impacted on our final leg, which is implementation uh, of the code and publication of the code, which the institution is currently tirelessly working to ensure that the code is ultimately delivered and we are able to, to, to envisage and embark on a mammoth task of implementation of this uh, 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 comprehensive, versatile, dynamic corporate governance code. Thank you, Chaka. That's an incredible introduction and overview of the Nklomi code. And I do want to recognize advocate and Tepe who is uh, online at the moment. He is the IOD Lesotho Deputy Board Chair. And thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we've got lots of questions, but I see Kangai has managed to get on online again. Um, Kangai, would you like to continue and conclude your presentation while you're still able to? Thank you. Uh, if, if you can hear me, I think yes. I, I should be able to, to continue. Thank you, please do. Kindly confirm you can hear me. Okay, thanks. So earlier on I covered the various approaches that were employed in Zimbabwe 
to fast track uh, good governance. And I covered the corporate governance framework that was established by the government and the establishment of the corporate governance unit under the office of the president. I also talked about the review of the Kanban Act and the foundation of the Zim code, which were primarily uh, led by the promoters with sponsors and service providers coming on board. And I was actually completing to touch on the key stakeholders and interested parties that are playing roles in various areas of corporate governance in Zimbabwe. Um, I would like to proceed to, to raise key imp governance imperatives that were addressed by the Zim call. Um, some issues that previously were bring challenges to good governance. And the first one at the top was addressing the relationship on ownership and control, separating the powers of the shareholders the board and management. That, that was really very key. And the constitution of boards, giving clear and clarity roles and function and duties of board members was quite very important and the court addressed that. Uh, the court proposed the implementation of board charters and evaluation of boards, board members and the remuneration of the boards, which was really one of the cause of the challenges that we had within the context of governance. Some of the issues that it addressed were to do with the governance of risks, oddities and controls, assurance frameworks, to ensure that there is need for internal and external audit and how they should be governed by audit committees. The conflict and corporate um, resolutions on matters to do with any conflict issues, as well as the disclosures of information, which is very key when we talk about attractive investors. So those were some of the key issues that, that were really addressed. And what we are seeing at the moment um, in, in terms of the implementation of ZimCorp is that there is a reasonable attempt to constitute boards according to the ZimCorp, to have various committees, to have non-independent executive directors, and to actually separate the role of the executive to non-executive directors. The appointment of directors on merit is actually happening. We're seeing a lot of companies actually advertising for special skills and competence that they need on their boards. So this is actually an outcome out of having, you know, this Zim code in implementation that companies have realized that we need specific skills that bring in competences rather than just bring in board members that we can choose from our group of friends, something like that. And what we are also seeing is the board charters are becoming very popular and they're actually part of audit. So whenever the auditors go into a company, one of the things that we like to do from a governance perspective is, is the company having a board charter. And some companies actually even post them on their websites, which is a very positive you know, outcome of, of this. And we are seeing a number of calls and tenders for board training, which means there's the realization that board members as they were appointed before, they need quite a lot of training to understand good governance and ethical leadership. So we are seeing that there are inductions being called on and even board evaluations by specific consultants firms that are trained and are well competent to actually deal with board evaluations. And in some cases, the self-regulated aspect of the boards evaluating themselves are actually coming on board. And even some of the sectorial codes like the Arab Z1 allows board members to actually evaluate how they are doing in terms of corporate governance. So that's a very key issue that we are seeing. And the boards, decisions made by the boards are actually coming on spotlight in the media and various platforms. And that aspect, have created a situation where both themselves then are now accountable, not just to the shareholders, but to the society, because the media is always hammering and hitting on what needs to be addressed from a board decisions, from how the companies operate, whether they are actually taking into account the triple P's that we also talk about when we talk about governance. So there's a push on compliance, there's an appreciation and the application of good governance currently in Zimbabwe. And from what we are seeing, there is also 
a hard push on accountability from the regulator's perspective, the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange, the Secret uh, Control, the Anti-Corruption Commission, uh, Commission. So these are some of the, the, the organizations within the context of corporate governance that are actually pushing hard from a regulatory perspective, the company law, the, the new acts that are coming on board. But from the soft side, where we come in to inspire and Lost King Guy. A lot of work is being done. One of the reports that we have said six percent of our state on owned enterprises have actually started to improve the way they run their companies. What I need you to cover. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kingai. We, we lost a little bit of you there, but you're back, which is good. I think there are two quite burning questions that have come through. The first one um, is really, uh, Karen, perhaps Auntie can talk to you. Uh, yes, yes, you, we can hear you. So we're just saying thank you very much, Kingai. Um, I think there's two questions that have come through specifically on what you're saying is the one, and that perhaps if I can uh, direct that to ANSI in terms of um, the role of government in setting these governance codes. So from Kangai's perspective in Zimbabwe, there's actually governments quite involved, but I know the IOD from your perspective uh, in South Africa, the government doesn't have that large involvement, isn't the custodian of the code. What is your sense of that in terms of government involvement? Is it something that you've discussed? Uh, thanks, Carolyn. Yes, I think it's imperative that government be, in for, be, be involved in some way or another. So in South Africa, um, as I said, um, the King Committee is not a regulatory institution or a government-backed institution, which does not mean that we don't have the support of government. government. So we have, for example, um, the Department of Trade and Industry, uh, the Department of Public Enterprises, um, National Treasury, um, the Auditor General, um, which is our as, as state uh, um, entity auditor. We have all of those um, institutions and, and bodies represented on the King Committee. They, they very much part of... Uh, the work that we do, and they were part of the drafting of King 4. When um, the Auditor General um, audit, as an example, they do take into account to what extent um, state-owned entities um, apply and disclose on, on King 4. So it happens in a more informal way um, of course, it is uh, uh, probably the ideal if there's more formal government backing, but, but I think um, the working relationship that the King Committee has with, with government actually indicates that there's an uh, internal motivation for, for this sort of uh, collaboration. Um, and, and so far, none of the parties has expressed a, a, a desire for that to become a, a more um, imposed sort of a relationship, you know, something that's um, imposed uh, externally. Uh, but uh, it, it is working well. And another example that I can just mention to, to show how well it's working is if, if you look at our recent, um, the um, a bill for the amendment of the Companies Act. Um, you know, the changes that are being um, proposed to social and ethics committees, um, to remuneration, a lot of that has been taken out of the King for um, report. So there's definitely cross-pollination um, and um, can it be even better? Yes, of course it can be, but but there is not definitely not a disconnect. There is a, a working relationship, mm -hmm. which is very important. 
Thank you, Ansi. And from a Botswana perspective, Timothy, um, the involvement of the stock exchange seems to have driven this need for this governance code. That governance code that's going to be the Institute of Chartered Accountants Involvement and um, BAOA in uh, the, the creation and the, the establishment of, of a corporate governance code, is that going to be for all entities or do you think that's really just for companies and maybe just for listed? Uh, thanks, Carolyn. Um, uh, even now, what has happened is um, the Basically, the BAOA, um, as you rightly put, uh, found or came into being, uh, you know, uh, after the BSC or the stock exchange had, had, had always been there and had always sort of um, uh, tried to, you know, um, push issuers towards compliance with the, uh, the best international codes um, available. Um, however, um, with the advent of the BAA coming into the picture, uh, is, uh, because their mandate is to apply a good corporate governance, uh, not only to listed institutions, but to um, also to SOEs, uh, but also to uh, large um, private companies, uh, companies that are employing a large number of people in the country or that have a very high turnover. Uh, so. It, it became important or apparent that you know there is a need to perhaps uh, go through the the the, what the the Kim three which we are applying at the moment or even the Kim four and you know sort of try and um, uh, make it applicable to 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 the situation on the ground as far as the statutes that exist for example for for banks uh, for the for the for the central bank. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to go to the central bank and say you have to comply with the uh, with King Four because it also under other statutes uh, which enforce that the 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 managing director of the bank must also be the chairman, for example. So, uh, you know, issues like that uh, have made it important for us to review uh, what code we are applying, and of course, you know, the issues of. Uh, the fact that you know, uh, as a country, uh, for example, we are sitting under uh, on top of uh, more than 200 billion tons of coal, yet um, businesses in this country are being asked to approach a green approach. So, what does that mean for the country as an uh, economic entity, and how do we uh, sort of approach the issue of the resources that we have versus? What uh, the environment needs, what what investors from overseas are expecting to see, uh, so that I think um, all those matters and in the process of applying King Three and uh, trying to apply King Four, uh, all those questions have brought it about uh, or made it important for us to review uh, the, the 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 national code. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, very really important. Uh, you know, the ESG factors come out out again. Um, I've got a question for Chaka quickly um, before I ask another one. But Chaka, the question was about the Nigerian code. Why the Nigerian code? I oh, know you're just trying to unmute. <laughs> there we go. Um, um, the Nigerian code, I think, uh, primarily uh, from a representation point of view, um, 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 uh, East Africa, and also um, given the size of uh, the economy in uh, Nigeria. So we found uh, it to be much more robust and uh, developed as opposed to uh, uh, other, 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 other um, uh, 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 regions, as it were, or other countries in, in, in Africa. Thank you, Chaka. Um, the other question I wanted to ask is that I, I just hear and I see integrated reporting coming through all of these codes now. Um, I mean, to the point where the integration is intergenerational. You know, this need to look um, across your organization, not in a siloed approach, 
bringing together what seems to be the you know the financial and the, the non-financial information it seems to be a an indicator of these codes in southern africa and I must just send apologies from Eswatini that they weren't able to represent their code here today. But um, maybe uh, if I can hand over to you again, Ansi, this integrated reporting seems to be a South African or Southern African emerging phenomenon. Is, is, it, is it something new or is it, is it something that um, is becoming in our, is it in our DNA now? I, I don't want to make too much of the differences uh, between uh, the developing countries and the, the developed countries, but I do think we see the world a little bit differently. Um, I was um, intrigued by Lesotho's approach, intergeneral, uh, intergenerational uh, value. Um, in um, the King Code, we have something similar if you're talking about DNA, uh, because I think these things talk about the DNA. We, we talk about the concept of Ubuntu, um, Kimutu Kabatu, uh, by being, a, uh, I'm a person through other people. Um, I am because you are, you are because we are. I, I think we perhaps live with this realization and, and and perhaps because of the social and economic challenges that we are, are all facing, um, this truth is made more poignant to us that, uh, you know, we live in a, a, a world where, where we really rely on our fellow human beings, where, where my humanity finds expression through yours. And that in that sense, you cannot see the corporation um, functioning outside of that, um, of, of that thinking. Um, we understand the corporation to be part of that interconnectivity. And it's not only that as human beings, we connected to each other, and also human beings in uh, when we function in corporate form, it's also that as human beings, corporations, entities, organizations, we're also connected to Mother Earth. So uh, I, I think it's this realization that, that we have, and I do think it has become part of our DNA, and that's why um, integrated reporting has been taken up so energetically and with so much um, enthusiasm, which is not to say that in countries like the US and the UK, it's not happening, but perhaps there what has happened is that um, they have lived with this paradigm of the company existing to serve shareholders primarily. They have lived with it so long that it's maybe more difficult to um, um, challenge that that thinking or, or for that or for this novel sort of thinking to um to, to um that to take to grow. Really. yeah mm. to take all so, that's right so a bit like you know a large parts of africa skipped over the landline telephone and went straight into the cellular <laughs> Um, we kind of skipped over this uh well we had shareholder supremacy for a while but we kind of leapfrogged almost into uh, integrated reporting and this integrated thinking. And as you say, this alignment with Mother Earth, with environment and society. Um, and as Chaka pointed out, this intergenerational. While you're on the floor, Ansi, there's one that says, uh, when is, the, when is the, the next version of King going to be looked at? <laughs> uh, putting you on the spot here. <laughs> so it's not on the cards as yet. Of, well, let, let me contradict myself. It's not being planned at the moment, but uh, 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 Professor King will tell you one of the things about the King Committee, uh, which makes us also uh, perhaps different from um, uh, uh, committees like the Cadbury Committee, is that we have continued to meet every quarter um, since establishment. So we keep meeting every quarter. We we remain um, 
very vigilant around developments. As you all know, there's a lot of development, uh, speaking about integrated reporting, there's a lot of development around um, corporate reporting um, and, 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 and corp the, uh, corporate reporting standards and how integrated reporting and IASB and ISSB reporting and um, enterprise value reporting, how all of that will fit together. So uh, I anticipate that after all of that has settled down, there will probably be a need to um, update uh, uh, King 4. Um, it also depends on where our uh, uh, changes to the Companies Act, um, uh, uh, you know, to what extent uh, um, those changes are implemented. Um, so, but so, no, it's not on the cards at the moment, but we're always keeping an eye out for whether it's still relevant and applicable. Thanks, Ansi. And lots of practice notes coming out at the moment. You know, the one yeah. on, the, on climate, the group governance structures, just lots of practice notes coming out. So thank you for that. Um, talking about the, um, the alignment with the investors and the investor demands, I know Tian had to drop off, but maybe if I can ask Sumetsi in terms of the stock exchange and the demand for this ESG, and this growing influence of this, you know, this new sustainability reporting standards. Um, what is the what is the stock exchange's response to those kinds of pressures? Is it is it just automatically going to be a listing requirement? It has to be, or what is your kind of measured response in that regard? Uh, thanks, Caroline. Uh, I, I think that's the. Uh, the right word uh, in terms of how issues see it. It's, it's a lot of pressure uh, because at, at the end of the day, we are sort of dealing with, um, I think, a culture of opaqueness in a way, uh, which we're sort of trying to move away from that as far as, um, you know, even when you're trying to speak to potential issuers, you know, the, the one thing that they're always concerned about is, um, the, you know, am I going now going to have to disclose, uh, you know, my competitive edge? Am I going to disclose this? They are worried about what they're going to disclose, and then you come on, uh, uh, come on, uh, on top of that, add, you know, other needs for di disclosure of, you know, ESG aspects, and um, it, it seems like a mountain for 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 a lot of uh, 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 um, business people that are coming onto the public uh, market. Um, so our approach has always been uh, to be consultative. And I think it's sort of uh, uh, what uh, you see also, you will see also with the, 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 the upcoming um, uh, 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 the code of corporate governance. I don't know what we will call it. Um, we'll certainly look for a, a significant uh, uh, name Mr. Ngofu, so that we can also, you know, have a, a properly named one. Uh, so, but certainly we is going to go through a lot of uh, process in terms of making sure that we uh, we consult uh, with the the public. Uh, we make sure that uh, the, as much as possible, uh, we show them best, what is there. For example, in the best codes in the world on King Three, for example, uh, or on King Four or the UK uh, code, this is what's out there in the world. This is what investors who you want to invest into your company are looking for. And these are the reasons that they want this type of information. And this is the reason why they want an integrated report. And then uh, from that, we can try and strike the balance. I, I, I particularly liked what uh, Lesotho have done with respect to SMEs. Uh, when we talk about SMEs, we, you know, we are talking about uh, uh, perhaps a kind of uh, uh, a business demographic that has certain challenges uh, in terms of manpower, in terms of resources to comply with um, all the, the major requirements. So you have to look at how you can give them uh, the opportunity to grow into the, uh, the, the, the highest levels of uh, compliance. I think really mm -hmm. important, thank you. Um, Taka, you had your hand up at one stage. Were you wanting to add? Yes, please. 
I was actually going to say ANSI has actually vindicated our approach as IOD Lesotho that, necessita that necessitated the development of the code, where I said we, we, we went back to pre-colonization pre uh, and industrialization in the times of uh, uh, King or, or Chief uh, uh, Moshomi. Uh, he was traversing the region, the Southern Africa region, providing counsel and his prophet uh, services and training on leadership. And you know what he would do uh, to, to teach leaders in those regions? Uh, whatever that he was due to him in terms of fees, cows, or whatever, then he would invest in those communities and really live with, with nothing. So that is why we are adamant on, uh, and embraced his transformational leadership uh, to ensure intergenerational value. So I just wanted to say to, to, to Ansi, uh, the teaching on Ubuntu comes from uh, King uh, Chief Mushomi actually, and he shared it with the rest of uh, the region and they embraced it as theirs. Uh, sec secondly, um, no, I, I, I think it was just a comment from uh, 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 Samit. So thank you, my brother. Thank you. I see some hands are raised if you'd like to put your questions in the chat. But I, I don't think we can have a governance around the world series without mentioning the, the new um, ISO standard um, on the governance of organizations, and that's ISO 37,000. I should say that properly, 37,000. <laughs> Um, so ISO 37000 was written with participation of um, 77 countries around the world, uh, including many African countries, um, and it really was intended and it is intended to be a global kind of normalization or a benchmark around good governance. Certainly, like other codes in Southern Africa, it's been influenced by the King Reports, of course. So I was just interested in what Ansi was saying in terms of the, um, the ethical underpinning. There's a big um, emphasis on the ethical underpinning that's come through in, in the ISO standard. Um, also um, talking about the integrated, and certainly there is a, an, over, an, an over, um, kind of overarching feel in and writing in the standard around integrated thinking and integrated reporting, or those are, and taking an integrated approach, or those that those have not been specifically outlined, and then of course the, the governance outcomes. I mean, the King report was the King four was the first one to um, establish governance outcomes, what these governance outcomes could be, and although we have four in King four, the international consensus landed on three. Um, and that was responsible stewardship. And whenever I hear, hear that word responsible stewardship, then I re it reminds me of a, a Good Governance Academy um, event a colloquium that we had where ANSI spoke about the living bridges and creating living bridges, uh, using trees and tree roots to create living bridges. And for me, that was such a, when I think about responsible stewardship, I think about that. And then it talks about ethical behavior um, and we had a discussion because King Four talks about ethical culture. So, of course, the South African delegation took ethical culture to the table at ISO, and there was a debate around it. And the debate really was stemmed with, yes, that the, the outcome needs to be a, a culture, an ethical culture that absolutely is correct. But they wanted, they wanted to emphasize the, the doing part, the verb of actually behaving ethically. So that was quite interesting for me because I hadn't been involved directly in, in the ethical discussions under, under King Four, but that was really quite interesting for me. And then the last one is really, uh, you know, what every organization is looking for in this, their stakeholders is the effective performance. And the reason why they said it wasn't exactly good performance is because good is subjective. Um, so they said ethical performance. So it's just a three, it's a responsible stewardship, um, the ethical behavior and effective performance. But in, in fact, when you unpack the essence of the four governance outcomes in King 4 and the, and the three, the essence of the three in ISO 37,000, 
there are that they are the same they have the same uh, basic components in it funny enough we took the word uh, legitimacy to iso and we got a complete reject because <laughs> it, it wasn't translatable it was misinterpreted it was misunderstood so i think in south africa and in southern africa we have this concept as you said this concept and chaka you mentioned it again this concept of ubuntu is this it's a natural respect and legitimacy for me is is about a stakeholder respect you know, it's respect for the law, legitimate in the eyes of the law, but respect for all your stakeholders. And I think that comes through quite clearly in, in the terms of Ubuntu. So it was quite interesting to see that, uh, you know, the ISO standard really is already represented in much of what we're doing in Southern Africa. Our next event is going to be on gov governance around the world is on China. So I'd like to, <laughs> I'm really excited to hear about that. That's on the 29th of March, and we've just opened it up now for registrations. But it'll be really interesting to see what the difference is. You know, we, we believe in Southern Africa, what we're hearing is this integrated um, respect for society, the natural environment. And we hear so much in the press about China, and we see press about, you know, the lack of um, respect for, for societies and cultures, and perhaps some environmental impacts that um, do not meet with our cultural expectations. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see what China has to say about their governance code. And it's a launch of a book at the same time. So this lady has been involved in uh, many Chinese uh, companies and um, is, is Chinese, <laughs> lived for many years in China. So it's going to get an English book that speaks about um, the governance approach in China should be quite should be quite interesting. So maybe just some last words, because I know the last words are, are generally quite uh, lengthy because you've heard now from the different codes. And I'm so sorry that we, uh, you know, Zimbabwe and Namibia has had to drop off. But maybe, Tsumetsi, if I can start with you um, in terms of what you've heard from the other codes and what you would perhaps take back into the Botswana code. What, what is the kind of thinking that you would like to emphasize in the work that's being done? Um, uh, thank you, thank you, Carolyn. Um, we, we, we certainly, uh, as I said, we are at the point where we are reviewing or, or coming up with a national code. And uh, I think what I'll probably take away most from this meeting is the fact that more than anything, a, a corporate governance code reflects society, the society, the history of that society, uh, how they've been doing business and uh, where they come from as a people as well uh, in terms of the history uh, and, and, and what they've gone through uh, in, 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 from a political perspective as well as from an economic perspective. And I think that really uh, goes uh, to um, the, the importance, the absolute importance of consultation. Uh, to come up with such an important um, code. And I think we are quite fortunate to be in Southern Africa at this point because we have a, a reference point uh, in the uh, uh, Mkloni uh, Code of Corporate Governance and the Kim 4 Code of Corporate, uh, Corporate, Corporate Governance. And we certainly uh, will use all these resources uh, to be able to say, how do we as Botswana uh, 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 position our uh, our businesses, the governance of our businesses, uh, well enough to attract the foreign direct investment which we need uh, to improve our economy. Um, since we are facing a lot of, for example, joblessness uh, for youth, and we are facing the challenge of, um, you know, greening our economy. How do we do that uh, uh, based on the demands, I mean, versus the demands of impact investors, for example? Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you. Um, while we've got Kangai on, on the line, um, any last comments from your side, if we, if we can get you back? Thank you.
No, unfortunately, it still seems to be packaging. Um, um, thanks, everyone, for, for attending. From our side, we have crafted a very good uh, look. I was hoping you could hear me. Okay, what I was saying is that we have put on paper um, we have put on paper a very good uh, guidelines and the nation have embraced this. What we now need to do is to leave what's on the paper so that we are then able to attract investment because the policy is already there, the laws are already there, the regulation is already there. So what we are doing as the Institute of Directors is to engage, to engage all stakeholders so that we begin to leave what's on the paper. Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, Ansi, when you did the, where you were project managing essentially the uh, King for writing, you had a, a tremendous stakeholder engagement uh, approach and you brought many industry leaders, et cetera, through that process. Is it something that you um, you found benefited um, from your King for benefited from that kind of approach, or would would you do something different in future? No, I agree with Tamitzi that um, it is um, absolutely critical to have that stakeholder engagement. The the I, I get back to the um, uh, the idea that. People need to be intrinsically motivated to follow the code. You can't only impose it externally. And if they've been part of the development process, then um, the chance, it's more likely that they will be motivated to follow because they start seeing the code as our code, not uh, you're expecting me to follow um, the code. So, so definitely, I, I think the stakeholder engagement is absolutely it, it just in it, it, it's also it's a bit arrogant to think that you have all the answers right um and uh, through stakeholder engagement uh, you actually your product um end up being so um rich um i, I would um uh, uh, think that especially on the stakeholder supplements that we would even want to engage more to um, uh, uh, if we do it the next time round to this extent. Thank um, you, Anson. Yes. Carolyn, can, can I just say one small thing that um, these days um, I, I feel um, we have to, we can't say it often enough. Um, I do think that, uh, you know, we, uh, it's very important um, that we have the foundation of a well-drafted governance code. Um, and it, it's, it's so lovely today to also hear about, you know, the traditional values that underpin the thinking behind the writing of these codes, which, which is, it's, it's so, makes you so proud to, to be African, right? But, uh, what worries me is that we don't walk our talk. Um, and, you know, our traditional values on paper and we talk about it and we remin reminisce about it. But if you look at how we're acting, um, we don't act in accord with this. So uh, I really think as much attention as we give to drafting of governance codes, we, we must, reflect a little bit on whether we have integrity. We talk about integrated thinking. Um, are we integrated or, or, or do we have integrity? Is, does our talking match what we're walking? Very, Thanks, very Karen. good. Very good. Thank you, Ansi. A absolutely. Are, are we walking the talk? You know, are we just writing better documents and better documents or are we actually living them? you know, the, the DNA again. Chaka, last points from your side. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Caroline and uh, my fellow panelists. I think uh, 
My takeaway, key takeaway, is uh, what Tsametsi uh, in their experience in Botswana in terms of uh, compliance uh, spoke about um, prospective issuers being worried about disclosure um, requirements, particularly on the issue in and around trade secrets and or competitive edge of uh, 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 companies or institutions, organizations, as it were. So I think in our case, given that we are also at an infancy stage with the Maseru securities market that is currently housed under our central bank of Lesotho, which will soon move and be independent as it grows. Uh, this is a key takeaway because um, uh, the listing requirements are going to be beefed up and or reviewed in line with uh, uh, the Moshomi code. So it's very important to, to underscore this key takeaway because at the end of the day, it's not our compliance, it's not about stripping bare people and taking them uh, uh, their natural uh, uh, power or to compete fairly and squarely. So I think I, I, that's, what, that's a key takeaway from me. And most importantly, a key takeaway also from what uh, ANSI has just highlighted that all well and good that we have uh, 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 went back to embrace this cultural heritage and the way that we are. And I said earlier when I, I started my presentation that there has been moral degeneration over time. But this code, because we have embraced it with something that is very familiar and still striking in our heads uh, with our elders that are, are, are presently alive, it is going to make the acculturation process, which is uh, acclimatization or embracing good governance uh, uh, much, much more easier. And I'm sure Ansi, uh, 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 with your experience with the, the various iterations of the King code, they were primarily underpinned by uh, the issue of uh, acculturation, you know? So, so, so I think that for me is a key takeaway that of course we must embrace and walk the talk uh, going forward. And lastly, uh, the issue of uh, consultation and stakeholder involvement is very, very, very key. And I think we got this right uh, uh, in our Mushomi committee, in as much as we, as the Institute of Directors, the Soto similar to our, our sister organization, IODSA, we are private uh, and we are not established by a statute of government. And all, actually, there's still debate now whether we transition from being here where we are and be like our fellow uh, professional bodies in Lesotho, like the Lesotho Institute of Accountants or the Law Society of Lesotho, you know. So, so, so this is a key takeaway for me that you don't necessarily need to be established by a statute of government, uh, 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 an act of parliament. If you have the right frameworks and strong foundations as an institution, you'll be able, you are destined uh, to succeed. Um, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. We've run out of time. We've got so much to say, but thank you very much for your participation and thank you for your time. It's been uh, two, uh, two hours because we've had to unpack all of these codes, but I think looking at the diversity amongst us, understanding that there is this international benchmark that's available, but each each national code has something really important for the people of that country. And to me, to your thing, to attract investors through good corporate governance and good financial reporting, that's for me, um, my key takeaway. And, and good governance needs good behavior. So thank you very much, everybody. And thank you everyone online and everyone on YouTube as well. Thanks everyone. Bye. <laughs>